Hello everyone and welcome to this week's iStorm Live Lounge. I'm Mia Elverson, I'm the creator of iStorm and the Live Lounge is here with interviews on a weekly basis where I bring in magnificent people to talk about different topics, sharing their expertise to educate and inspire and motivate. And the iStorm Live Lounge is currently in lockdown mode, so I'm doing the interviews through Zoom. And today I brought in someone on the topic that I think is really, really important at the moment to discuss. And that's about working with children in lockdown. How do we manage it? Can we actually thrive working and parenting in lockdown? So I brought in Elaine Halligan, who is the director of the Parent Practice London. She's also the author of My Child's Different, and she's just in general an incredible person who's very wise and incredibly experienced on the topic. So welcome Elaine Halligan. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here because there is no greater topic to talk about today than working from home and parenting at home. And I have to just start by saying if you are trying to do a full-time job seven hours a day and look after the children, it's just not possible. So we, we can explore that more and I'm hopefully gonna give you some top tips about how to make it calmer and easier. Fabulous. We've already, already established that it's impossible. <laughs> so that's good. And we'll break that down a little bit and give advice on that. So Elaine, how, how are you doing at the moment? How are you holding up? What's your situation personally? I think personally, we're doing all right. Melissa, my business partner and I are kind of pivoting like crazy in the business because at the parent practice, our offering to date has been almost 100% kind of live in-person events. So, so we work throughout Southwest London, um, throughout uh, London and the home counties, delivering school, corporate uh, workshops and doing parent sessions. So literally over the last four weeks, we have been pivoting like crazy to put everything online. And, and all I'll say is thank goodness we have a growth mindset because we're coping, we're managing and we're providing that support that parents desperately need just now. Absolutely. You're doing a fantastic job with the parent practice. Um, so tell us a little bit more about what, what it is you offer. Sure. Uh, the parent practice is celebrating their 16th birthday this year. I can't quite believe how long we've been in business for, but we offer pragmatic, practical tips to help parents um, bring out the best in their children, to help them be cooperative, confident, competent, motivated, resilient, all those qualities that actually now we're seeing that our children need more than ever in order to cope with this new normal. And I, one of my favorite mantras, interestingly me, which I've been telling my children for decades, well, at least over a decade, is that the only constant is change. And one of the things we really need to help our children with at the moment is just adapt, be flexible and, and be able to cope with change. And, and for some children, that's incredibly hard, uh, not to mention the adults as well. Absolutely, of course. And, and one thing that I keep saying, I think it's really, really important for children to understand and for us as well, that this is not going to last forever. It's a period of time that is unusual for everyone things are going to get better and back to some sort of a normal again, especially for little children. They might think that this is what it's going to be like forever. So it's really important to just say that it is a period of time that will end and then things will get better. I love that. It is a moment of time, but we do need the pragmatic practical toolkit um, to help ourselves through this storm. And I always say that, you know, parenting ordinarily in ordinary times is challenging enough. And, and gosh, don't I know that I have um, a child who's neurodiverse and, and my backstory is that I came into parenting absolutely in crisis because I just couldn't manage my child, my son, um, who's now a young adult. And if I'm really honest with you, me, I have found parenting the most debilitating, the hardest the most overwhelming, the most kind of guilt-inducing job I think I've ever done. And initially, I was not very good at it. And, and the reason I wasn't good at it was because I just didn't understand my son or his needs. And I think many of your listeners might identify with this. I spent much of my time in the early days um, nagging. I don't know whether you do this with your teenage son. Repeating, reminding, cajoling. I bribed, I threatened, and ultimately... I, 
I did things that I deeply regretted. And that was in kind of normal times. So if there's no parenting manual ordinarily for normal times, I guarantee you that now in this unprecedented time, we have absolutely no roadmap whatsoever. And I think it's really important to, to highlight that there is no, this is not black and white, this is incredibly gray. And what may work for one parent may not work for another parent. So, so it may be useful for me to share, you know, what I'm hearing on the ground working with our clients over the last four weeks. And we have clients all over the world. Um, one client is in lockdown in Madrid in a small two bedroom flat with three boys and for 33 days, they have not been able to leave their home. So that client is on an emotional roller coaster. There are highs, there are lows, and, 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 and she's coping, but it's hard. And then I have other clients actually on the other side of the spectrum who actually are quite enjoying it. <laughs> They're enjoying working from home, not having the commute, and they are the lucky ones who have the resources. Uh, and one of my clients has their German au pair still living with them because she couldn't get back home to be with her family. So look, that's at absolutely the opposite end of the spectrum. And, and those clients are coping well because they can work with support. And, and I would say the third kind of category of clients I have is, is kind of entrepreneurs who are used to working from home. So their setup is there, but they're, they're used to having their children at nursery or at school. And, and of course now it, it, it's kind of like a United Nations timetable organizing when they can work and who does the child care and that's when it's really important if you are part uh, parenting together not parenting apart um, it's really important that you have some sort of schedule because otherwise it is not going to be possible to parent your kids to do the child care and to do a seven hour day job at home we have to kind of give up that completely unrealistic expectation so most of my clients have kind of bedded down into a structure now a schedule of kind of two or three hour chunks on and then child care and then two or three hour chunks again of work so you know your seven hour working day often migrates into the evening um, and, and they are coping but everyone's experiences me are going to be so different depending on their resources and what i do know is every parent i speak to is doing the best job they can with the resources they've got physically mentally and emotionally yeah of course because it's not only the practical things and the timetable is it then it's your emotional um stability and and how you're feeling as well and uh, we spoke yesterday when we were preparing this talk and ironically that was my first day when i actually fell out a bit with my son uh, i'm very fortunate i'm one of those people who actually haven't I've, i can't go out that much but Apart from that, I can continue working. I've got one son who's a teenager who's very self-motivated and fun. And we've, we've had a pretty good time together. We've actually got to know each other in a different way. And um, but I, because he's so self-motivated, normally he doesn't demand that much. So I'm very happy to supply the support he needs. Um, but of course, now when he needs more and we're more together, it's going to be more and more and more. And I, was, I had a very busy day yesterday uh, with a lot of work and uh, he came in and when he needs something, he needs it immediately. <laughs> and um, um, it, eventually I, I fell out with him because I was so upset and I was very emo emotionally unstable and, and I didn't like myself at all. He didn't like it, of course. And in the end, we just had to sit down and have a chat. And I said, look, this is why it's happening. This is what's going on. And um, he sort of just grumbled and went away. And then in the evening, I said, do you know what I look like when I'm not coping? So just put everything aside, give me a hug and say, come here, mom, let's drop everything and give me a hug. And he just started laughing. I say, yeah, I know I should do that. I will do that next time. But that's such a, that, that's such a fabulous story because I think that will resonate with so many listeners. You know, what do we do when our buttons get pressed? And, and you, our buttons are going to get pressed far more often than, than, ordin, than ordin, in, order, in ordinary life. Um, and so it's really important to be able to recognize that we need to press a pause button. We need to kind of um, adopt those deep breathing strategies or whatever techniques we've got to press a pause button before we do or say something that we'll deeply regret. So, so me, what I'm hearing from you is you are 
um, perfectly imperfect. <laughs> if you are absolutely like every other parent out there, we will lose it at times. And it's really important to have the skills and strategies to know what to do to press that pause, pause button in order to keep calm before we do or say something regret. But what I love about you is that you repaired afterwards. And, and I think we need to be really honest here with ourselves and have reasonable realistic expectations of what we can do as a parent and yes we're living in a pressure cooker just now and there may be incredible stresses not just to do with children's behavior but to do with workload and and i often say to my clients you know the job you've got just now is almost impossible to do you are entertainment's director you are um head chef you are chief laundress you are an entrepreneur or an employee trying to keep the work going. Um, you're a counselor and a coach coaching those teenagers who are completely feeling that they are socially isolated and feeling a huge sense of loss that school's finished, no GCSEs, no A-levels, and even the young adults who have left university have just been dumped. So, so we're dealing with so many kind of job descriptions, it's gonna be impossible to fulfill that. And so I would just say at this point that um, we really do need to help ourselves by realizing that being a good enough parent is what we should be striving for. And, and that idea of being a perfectionist, it's a complete myth. There is no such thing as the perfect parent. And it's about being good enough. And it's about not worrying about what other people think. And, and this is a whole kind of interview or conversation in itself. But I had one client the other day just saying, oh, Elaine, I'm looking on social media and I'm seeing all these other mummies, all these um, mummies doing wonderful art projects or baking the most incredible cakes. And she said, I'm not a baker and it makes me feel kind of inadequate. And, and one of the top tips we have there is, you know, you have to stop thinking about what other people think about you. You've got to go back to what's, what are your core values? What's right for your family? what you can do, you know, and, and, and just spending time with your children when you can is one of the most important things you can do. And as for the not being a baker, I think anyone can just get a packet of porridge oats out. <laughs> you can tell I'm in Scotland. <laughs> packet of porridge oats, some butter, um, some honey, <laughs> golden syrup, and before you know it, you've got flapjacks. <laughs> so there's always something we can do. And you know what else, Elaine? You can actually buy them ready-made these days and just have some amazing cookies and flapjacks. You don't have that, to do it yourself. That's absolutely and the, right. Yes. <laughs> and the thing, this is the thing with social media as well. And this is what, what really, really can be disturbing is when people post on social media, they are only going to post their best. They're not going to post their miserable flapjacks and cakes, are they? It's only the people who do it to perfection who's going to share it. And when we see 10 of those, you know, during a, a week, we think that everyone is baking perfect cakes, which is not the truth, because there's a lot of many millions of people out there who are not sharing their failed cakes and not made cakes at all <laughs> so the end the end result is look just give yourselves a break and be the good enough parent absolutely so um th that's a little bit about our expectations on ourselves working from home with children and it's important to just set those expectations and know that you there's no perfect at the moment um and then we uh, we were going to talk a little bit about connection and communication as well Absolutely, because I think at this time, one of the most important things you can help your children with is processing their emotions and their feelings. One of the things we teach about at the parent practice is about the importance of emotional intelligence. Um, people may hear it referred to as emotional quotient or EI, but it's absolutely fundamental that our children are able to recognize respect and kind of manage their feelings in the moment because if they cannot do that I guarantee parents will see it in the form of some sort of I'm going to say misbehavior. Um, we also as parents need to be able to manage our feelings and emotions and I think the story you shared there me is very applicable you know your emotions overwhelmed you 
all those thoughts, beliefs, and assumptions were generated by those emotions. And in that moment, it was really difficult for you to dig deep into that parenting toolkit and, and respond to your son's needs. So being able to recognize our emotions, be emotionally intelligent and model it for our children is absolutely key. Um, so, so one of the things we're going to see more and more in family life just now is major meltdowns from our children. Uh, and most behavior, I would say, is a form of communication. And, and, and behavior is also mostly generated by feelings and emotions. And so what we do need to do is help our children manage their emotions by helping them name their feeling and validate their feeling in order to dissipate it. Because all the, um, all the fMRI scans um, show us that when people try and suppress their emotions, the emotions still stay there. And if the emotions are still overwhelmed in the brain, what happens is we have no capacity in the cool brain to problem solve. And everything about life just now is about finding solutions and problem solving. But you know yourself, me, if we're overwhelmed with emotions, no one's listening to us. And the worst thing we can say to our children is don't worry about it. So, so I'll give you an example. And I, I don't know, with a littley, you could just see a major meltdown just by giving them the wrong dinner. <laughs> yes, they, they may be wanting pizza or spaghetti bolognese, but we give them fish pie. And they have, may have the most almighty meltdown. And in that moment, the worst thing we can say to our child is, oh, for goodness sake, why are you making such a fuss? Yeah, don't worry about it. You can have pizza tomorrow. Or else sometimes we say, but, but this is your favorite food. You ate it yesterday. Why are you not eating it tonight? Or sometimes we say, oh, you're so ungrateful. Yeah, <laughs> you just don't appreciate anything I've done for you. Having spent hours cooking at that food and, and shopping and gosh, you're so selfish. And so we go on and on, don't we? Kind of um, denying, dismissing our children's feelings. And when we do that, the feelings just build up even more and what you will find in terms of your behavior from your child is maybe more rebellion, maybe more resentment. They may get aggressive. They may lash out or depending on their temperament, they may just withdraw and retreat and become very quiet. So our job is to definitely name that feeling in order to manage it. And you know yourself, me, if someone helps you and, and says, I understand how you're feeling. I absolutely get that you were at bursting point yesterday. When you feel heard and validated, your brain kind of calms down a bit. And then you're in this magic place of knowing how to problem solve. And everything about our feelings is about turning them into actions. So in that little example I gave, just to finish it off with the little boy who's upset about dinner, all we'd say to him is we would name the feeling of perhaps disappointment we don't know how he's feeling but we're going to guess and we could just say harry i can tell by the look on your face and the way you're talking to me you are really disappointed that you haven't got pizza tonight mm. maybe in your head you just thought it was pizza tonight and you were so looking forward to it and i can tell you're feeling really sad that you haven't got your favorite dinner and then just stop because as parents, we have a temptation to keep going on and on and on, advising, reassuring, lecturing, but less is more. And when he gets the idea that we're actually listening to him and, and connecting with him before correcting the behavior, and that's a big mantra for us, you have to connect with your child before you correct. He'll suddenly realize that you get it, and we'll say it's important to you that you get a choice to maybe choose some of the meals we have this week. I wonder if we could have a pizza night on Friday and maybe you could create a list of all the wonderful toppings you want to put on. And then suddenly his brain has come calmer, he's problem solving, and you'll find that the misbehavior has dissipated. This is amazing advice. <laughs> and I think that everyone who's listening to this can uh, will resonate with what you just said and how easy it is to just be. Um... Oh, oh, I would say it's not that easy, actually. <laughs> it, it, I may make it sound easy, but actually I think this is a skill that is very anti-intuitive because it's not our natural tendency to validate emotions. Most of us want to stick a sticky plaster over them and make them go away. 
So your son yesterday desperately needed your, your attention and um, you weren't able to give it in that moment for a variety of reasons. But if in that moment we'd said to him, honey, I can tell that what you're wanting to do is really important to you just now. I can tell by the look on your face that, that you are determined to get this task done and you need my help. This is going to be disappointing for you just now. I have to finish a piece of work and I know that's not what you want. And I'm going to ask you to be patient, but I, and I will come back to you in half an hour. And, and that takes some time to do because ordinarily we're trying to correct the behavior. Because if we see our children being disrespectful, being rude, being demanding, that that creates a whole list of thoughts and assumptions in our brains, such as, God, he, he's so selfish. He doesn't realize what I've got to do just now. And as soon as we go down that route, all connection disappears. So emotion coaching is all about connection. We're not for one minute saying that we're going to ignore the behavior. We do need to manage misbehavior, but we're not going to manage it in the moment. We're going to connect first before we correct. That's great. Yeah. I, I don't know what I said if I said it was easy, but I meant it's easy to resonate with the scenario you painted oh, out. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Because I think we're all facing that. And uh, it's easy to go down the route of being accusing the children instead of supporting them and communicating with them. So that's what I meant. Um, and of course, bringing them on board and let them plan and, and involving them in, um, you know, all the the things that we need to do with cooking and cleaning and everything in a way that is building up their self-esteem and, and giving them a bit of power as well to feel that they have tasks and different things that they're responsible. That That's good too, isn't it? Yeah, it's interesting you choose the word power. Um, I would alter that to kind of um, um, giving them a little control of their lives, giving them a bit more agency and autonomy, but you're absolutely right. Um, independence and self-reliance is key. And, and, and to date, if you haven't thought about this much as a parent, usually because it's quicker and easier for us to do it ourselves. Yeah. You know, teaching children how to cook, um, getting them to clean their bedroom, um, helping them understand how important it is that they do their laundry. Um, it is all really important. But in the moment, we often don't teach and train our children to do it because it's quicker for us to do it ourselves. So um, I would say using that biblical analogy. If you give a man a fish, you give him a meal. But if you teach him how to fish, you give him a lifetime of meals. And that is exactly what we need to do with our children. We need to teach them how to fish. This is an opportunity for us to give them some agency, some control in their lives in terms of decision making. And my top tip is give them chores to do. Definitely the littlies, right through to the young adults and the teenagers. Give them responsibilities and chores to do, whether it's sorting out the bins, whether it's feeding the dog, whether it's walking the dog, changing the cat litter, or changing their bed on a Friday. Absolutely vital that they have some chores to do around the house. So yes, agency, autonomy, independence, self-reliance is the greatest gift you could give your children. Fabulous. These are such, such valuable, such valuable advice, Elaine. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you would like to say or that we haven't covered? Yes, I think one of the key issues for most families just now is getting their children cooperative, um, listening to instructions, getting them motivated to do what needs to be done. And, and children will be cooperative and motivated only when they feel good about themselves. And children, in order to feel good about themselves, need a really strong sense of self-esteem and self-worth. And that comes from using the power of our words. Now, inadvertently me, and I'm generalizing here, but most of us as parents spend more time giving attention to the behavior we don't like. It's human nature. It's kind of... Um, it, it, there's a little part of our brain, if I can give a little bit of science here, called the reticular activating system. And the RAS is a bit of our brain that's programmed to look for and notice what we think is important. So I'll give you a little example. Let's say you're buying a new car and you go out into the streets of Brighton. And I don't know, maybe you've decided to buy a Mini Cooper. And you go into the streets of Brighton and suddenly, having decided to buy a new car, you suddenly see that car everywhere. Have you ever noticed that? And you clock, oh my goodness, I've never seen so many Mini Coopers here. And you clock the wheel trim, the paintwork, the engine size. And that's because your reticular activating system is programmed to look for what's important to you. 
Now, in family life, the same thing happens. If we're programmed to say that for our child sitting with their bottom on the chair, using their knife and fork, um, washing hands before dinner, trying what's on their plate is all important, that's all we'll look out for, yeah? Um, sorry, if that's what we think is important, um, we, we won't look out for that though, we'll look out for the stuff when they're not doing it well. So when they swing on their chair legs, when they eat with their fingers, when they don't try food that we've put in front of them, that's what we'll notice because that's what we think is important. And inadvertently what happens is we come over as being a little critical, a little negative, and guess what? It's demotivational for the children and, and they're not inclined to be motivated to do what needs to be done. So the trick here, or the key here to get motivated children is to use the power of your words. And we say at the parent practice, the most important skill is descriptive praise. It's noticing um, all the things your children are doing right, looking for effort, um, attitude, progress, improvement, qualities, characteristics. So instead of the good boy, well done, you're amazing, you're so clever, I'm so proud of you, um, we should look for any progress they make. Um, thank you for washing your hands before dinner without me even asking. You're a boy who's getting into really good habits and behaviors. Or for a, an older child, it's, um, yeah, thank you for stripping your bed this Friday. I never even had to ask you to do that. You're becoming, you know, really helpful. And you're making a big contribution around the household. I appreciate that. Or with an older child, uh, me, it could be, you know, I've noticed that um, you're monitoring your screen time. You know, you said that you'd had enough of playing Fortnite. It's really good that you can recognize some self-control and when it's time uh, to give it up. <laughs> so, so those kind of things are really difficult to notice because more often we'd be going, when are you going to get off that screen? And we'll be nagging, repeating and reminding. So descriptive praise is one of the greatest motivators. It's about noticing what our children do right. And that in itself, that one skill in itself, will raise self-esteem. And when you've got children with good self-esteem, they'll be more cooperative. And at the younger age, they'll do it to please you. And at the older age, they'll do it because it just feels good for them. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't think I will ever hear I've had enough of Minecraft, but... Oh, did I choose the wrong it. example there? <laughs> <laughs> I chose the wrong example for you there, me. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe bang on. Anyway, thank you so much, Elaine. This is fabulous. And I would like for you to tell us a little bit about your book because you're the author of the uh, My Child's Different book. Tell us about it. Oh, that's kind of you to ask me. Um, I have a young adult son who's 24 now. But the story is that at the age of seven... Um, my little boy, Sam, was excluded from his third school in so many years. So um, 16 years ago, uh, I found myself as a parent completely in crisis. I had a little boy who was misunderstood. Um, he had some specific learning difficulties like dyslexia, but he was also diagnosed with a whole host of other things, ranging from oppositional defiance disorder to pathological demand avoidance, to ADHD, and he became known as the alphabet kid. And can you imagine as a parent, you know, what it's like when you have a child who is so different that they cannot be educated? And yet I just sensed that my son was like a rock covered in mud. And I just knew that if we got rid of some of that mud, we would find a sparkling diamond underneath. And sure enough, um, I retrained then as a parenting specialist, started to understand him, his needs, his temperament. Um, we got him into the right educational system, which was a school for dyslexics, where they allowed him to absolutely find what he was good at. And when your children can find their strengths, then their self-esteem can rise, even though they may be unconfident in certain areas. And so the story is that um, after a couple of years out of school, Sam managed to get back into school. Um, he finished his education as head boy and finished school feeling really worthy, knowing where his strengths lie, but still to this day, unconfident in literacy because he's severely dyslexic and he's now an entrepreneur. So the book, My Child's Different, is a kind of celebration of all the wonderful qualities our neurodiverse children bring to society. And it's a book about giving hope 
and optimism to any parent who may be struggling out there thinking that their children just aren't neatly fitting into our traditional education system. And I guarantee there are so many children who can have fallen into that category. And the unique quality about the book, and I don't think there's any other book on the market like this actually, is that it's got three voices in it. It's got my voice as the mum, it's got Sam's voice in, and we spent a whole year interviewing him, asking him about his experiences and memories, and that was quite traumatic in itself. And then it's got my business partner's voice in Melissa, who was our original parenting coach. So it's a wonderful voice of child, mother, and coach, and it's a story full of hope and optimism. Makes me really tearful hearing that story, Elaine. Aww. Well done, well done, everything you've done. And I'm sure that will be helpful for a lot of people. Um, you've you. also, you've got, um, people can order the book. I'll post the links after to how they can find you and the book. But you've also got a free download. Tell us about that. I'm so excited. Just today, we have um, released a new free download, which is a pack of 30 day to learn cards. Um, I call them um, flashcards for adults. I have to be careful there because I sometimes say adult flashcards. <laughs> they're not X-rated content, I promise you. Um, they're, they're flashcards for adults. We, we sell a physical pack, but actually now we've got a download of them as a PDF. And they're, it's a wonderful little kind of flashcards of all the key skills that you need to um, enable you, you as a parent to bring out the best in your kids. And then every day there is a tiny five minute kind of top tip or activity or thought for the day. And, and we're offering those as a free download to anyone who signs up on our website at The Parent Practice. And I'm sure you'll probably put the links in the, in the notes to this interview. Absolutely, most definitely. That's fantastic. Um, thank you so very much. And if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Um, it, it's, it's Elaine at theparentpractice.com. Um, but I think, you know, check us out. Um, do your due diligence. We have a podcast uh, called The Parent Practice Podcast. Um, um, we're doing weekly interviews just now. So that's a way of finding out more about Melissa and I and what we offer. And we also have a most fabulous Instagram account, which we've just got going in the last kind of two months. And, and that has so many just top tips, which are in what I call munchable chunks, because parents are in complete overwhelm just now. The, 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 you know, my email inbox is overflowing and every parent I speak to say, kind of says, oh, please. So, so whatever we're offering, it's got to be a munchable, digestible chunks and the Instagram account's fabulous. I think that goes for everything at the moment. Uh, keep it short, keep it to the point and be supportive. And um, so rather than sharing all the links, what's the website? And I'm sure people can find it the podcast and the Instagram account from your website, right? Exactly. So it's www. W dot oh, sorry, yes, it's www.theparentpractice.com. Simple as that. Thank you so much. What's the rest of your day looking like now? What are you up to? Uh, well, I'm based in Scotland. I have two mad ADHD working Cocker Spaniels who I think are training for the um, Olympics in 2021. Um, as we kind of gorge ourselves on food and maybe a bit too much drink, my dogs <laughs> are becoming absolute athletes. So our days are spent kind of on the beach doing a good hour and a half walk, um, meeting with clients. And then I've got another interview like this, uh, me at 12.30. So yeah, it's all fun. Keeps me busy, keeps me occupied. Very good. Thank you so much, Elaine. Uh, stay well and keep busy and stay healthy. And I'll share all your links. And if people have any questions, please put them in the comment box below, of course, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thanks, me. Take right. care of yourself. Bye for Look now. Look at yourself. Thank you so much. And bye bye. I'll be back next week with a new iStorm live launch. So keep your eyes on the iStorm page on Facebook at 11 o'clock every Thursday. Thank you for watching this episode. Bye for now.